we are going to start by looking at some important definitions. To begin with, I, it's not, I'm going to call it a game. I don't know if it's really that much fun, or, but it, we'll call it a game. And our first definition that we're going to learn is angles in standard position. So we're not going to write this down, but I call this games, this first game, angle in standard position or not. So what I do is I draw an angle. Uh, let's draw an angle right there, label that angle, and on one side we're going to put yes, this is in standard position. On the other side we're going to put no, this angle is not in standard position. So we start with this one. Is this angle in standard position, yes or no? I'm going to tell you this one is yes. So I'll give you a couple of examples, and then playing the game, you have to decide what is the definition of something in standard position based on the examples. So just having one example, that's probably not enough to figure out a definition. If I draw another angle here, This one is not in standard position. Another example. This example is not in standard position. What are you thinking? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Oh, you are correct. Okay. How about how about um, that one? What are you thinking? Yes or no? Some people are thinking no. Some people are thinking yes, it's unsure. Okay, this one is, ooh, it is in standard position. Oh, so tricky. <laughs> and what about that one? Why not? You're right, that one is in standard position. What about, oops, Mike. What about that one? That one is not, not in standard position. So now we've had seven examples. Again, you didn't have to draw them down if you didn't want to, but now do, we, do you think you have enough that you could say something's in standard and angles in standard position or not? Yes? So what? So now we've done this. Let's see if we can write a definition. Start it off with an angle is
All right. There's the start of the definition. How does that definition end? What's important for an angle in standard position? It starts with its function. Yes. If it starts on the positive x axis. So if we look at all of our examples of the ones that were in standard position, all of the ones on the left started on the positive x-axis. And all of the ones on the right started somewhere else. So if I put another example up here, is this angle in standard position? Not yet. I did this to trick you. Not to trick you. I missed an arrowhead. All right? So without that arrowhead, you couldn't, see, with that arrowhead not there, if I take that arrowhead, you don't know, oh, did you start there and end there, or did you start there and end there? OK? And so it's unclear, because this would not be in standard position. This would be in standard position. So you need that arrowhead pointing there. I had a student lose only two half marks on the entire grade 12 exam, and one of them was the arrowhead on an angle in standard position. So an angle is in standard position if it starts on the positive x-axis. So if I was going to estimate these angles in degrees, can you see that this one looks like 90 plus 90 plus 90, that's 270, maybe another 40 more. Maybe I could estimate that one to be 310 degrees. So that would be an example of 310 degrees in standard position. This one would be 90 plus, maybe this is 135 degrees. So the first thing is to understand that when we're going around in a counterclockwise direction, all the angles are positive. This one, we go 90, 180, plus another 60. This one here would be labeled as negative 240 degrees. So if it's going in the positive direction, it's counterclockwise. In the negative direction, is in the clockwise. And this one goes around once, would be 360, goes around twice, which would be 720. I would guess that this angle might be around 780 degrees. So in grade 10 and 11, you mostly looked at angles between 0 and 360 degrees once around, one rotation around. Now in grade 12, we don't have to limit it to that. We can go as many times around the axes as we want to. So there's our first definition. And we just played the game, standard position, not in standard position. Okay. Our second important definition that we are going to look at are reference angles. And we have to finish this definition. A reference angle is, and so I'm going to show you some reference angles. Okay? If I have an angle drawn in standard position, say, thirty degrees then our reference angle is 30 degrees. If 
I draw. an angle in quadrant 2, and I say that that angle is 135 degrees, then my reference angle is 45 degrees. So we're kind of playing what the heck is a reference angle game. If I draw an angle in quadrant 3, negative 160 degrees, then my reference angle is 20 degrees. If I draw an angle of 275 degrees in quadrant 4, my reference angle is 85 degrees. So now the question is, is that enough examples for you to finish the definition? A reference angle is the inside angle. So how do we define inside angle? Like what do you mean by inside angle? Okay. So we got a little bit more clarity th there. Because the inside angle, why, why don't I pick maybe it's like five degrees here? So you're saying the one from the x-axis to the line. So you're saying this is the reference angle in this case. Okay. This is the reference angle in this case. This is the reference angle in this case. And this is the reference angle to that case. So the reference angle is the angle between the x-axis and where the, where the angle ends, okay, the line where the angle ends. That where an angle ends has a special name, so I'll add that to the definition. We call where the angle ends the terminal arm of the angle. It's not like the arm is going to die terminal that sense, but. And when describing to the x-axis, why isn't it this one? Because that would also go back to the x-axis. It's going to be to the nearest x-axis. So reference angle. A reference angle is. The angle between the terminal arm and the nearest x-axis. One of the examples that I chose when showing our examples is I chose negative 160 degrees because you might be tempted in that one to say that your reference angle should be negative 20 degrees. Can you see yourself maybe thinking it should be negative in that situation? Okay. But reference angles are always positive. So your reference angle will always be between zero and 90 degrees. Could you have a reference angle of zero degrees? Yeah, if it ended right on the x-axis, it would be zero degrees. Could you have a reference angle of 90 degrees? Yes, if it ended right on a y-axis, it's going to be 90 degrees. Labeling it, you wouldn't know, well, which is the nearest x-axis? They're both exactly the same. It wouldn't matter. 
but this is our second important definition for reference angles. Now, you've used reference angles in the past. So we'll do a little bit of review of that from grade 11. Why do we have reference angles? And why are they important? So with a reference angle of 30 degrees, we'll use 30 degrees because 30 of the degrees is one of the angles that you had temporarily memorized for grade 11 and may have since forgotten, but that's okay. We, we learn them again. So if I draw all the different angles from 0 to 360 degrees that have a reference angle of 30, so I'll do quadrant 1, quadrant 2, here I'll label these quadrant 1, quadrant 2, quadrant 3, and quadrant 4. You remember how the, the quadrants are labeled? 1, 2, 3, 4, starting top right and going in counterclockwise. So in each of these, this would be my actual angle, 30 degrees, 150 degrees, 210 degrees, and 330 degrees. And my reference angle in purple here would be this one, this one, nearest x-axis, nearest x-axis, nearest x-axis. The notation we use is we use whatever we label our angle with. So if I had labeled my angles all with theta, and theta is a Greek letter that mathematicians have, for whatever reason, decided, ooh, we like using that letter with angles. I don't know the exact history of who decided that first, but sort of historically, that's what's ended up happening. And if we label our angle with theta, we label our reference angle with a little r. So if you labeled your angle with x, your reference angle would be x with a little r. If you decided to, your favorite letter for labeling angles was w, then you would relabel your reference angle with a w with a little r. So our reference angle is labeled with theta with a little r. Now, the reason we have reference angles is because in trigonometry, back in grade 10, you learned Sokotoa, that sine was the opposite over hypotenuse, cos was adjacent over hypotenuse, tan was opposite over adjacent. Okay? So in this situation with 30 degrees, I could draw a triangle. I could draw a bunch of triangles with 30 degrees. The powerful thing about trigonometry is no matter how big or how small I draw an angle with 30, uh, draw a triangle that has an angle of 30 degrees, if it is a right angled triangle, sine of 30 degrees is always the same thing. You go to your calculator, you type sine of 30, and it gives you a value. Do you remember what the value was? for 30 degrees from grade 11? 0. 0.5. Awesome. One half. So it's 0. 0.5. It's equal to one half. I wrote it as a fraction because the power of trigonometry says that if I draw any triangle on here, I could find a point, for example, I could find a point on that line so that this length is 1. And if that length is 1, my hypotenuse would be 2. Guaranteed. If I chose another point further on, this is the power of trigonometry, 
if I chose another point further on so that this length was 2? I know that this is 4. Because trigonometry says whenever you have an angle of 30 degrees, sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, which means the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse always has to reduce to 1 half. So if this side is 2, this has to be 4 because 2 over 4 makes a half. And that's true for any triangle, no matter how big or how small. If you end up finding one here, made this length equal to 7, well, this length would be 14. That always happens with 30 degrees. And it's true for every angle that no matter how big or small you make the triangle, the ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse stays the same. And that's why your calculator has all those ratios built into it. That's what trigonometry, that's what makes trigonometry so powerful, is that knowing these ratios allows you to solve all sides of triangles and figure everything out. Now, you could do a squared plus b squared equals c squared and find out that this side would be the square root of 3. And from that, we could say on our first triangle here, I could also figure out what cos of 30 degrees was. That's the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So I could write that as the square root of 3 over 2. If you go to your calculator and you type in sine or cos of 30 degrees, you get 0.866. So as a decimal, this is 0 0.866. Now that's another one that you happen to have memorized from grade 11, that cos of 30 degrees was root 3 over 2. And tan of 30 degrees would be 1 over root 3, which is the same as root 3 over 3. And you could type that into your calculator as well. So I'm going to go tan of 30 degrees, and I get 0.577. Now, I wrote the decimals because I want to show you what happens when we get to 150 degrees. With 150 degrees, if you type in, and I'll switch colors so they don't, sine of 150 degrees, cos of 150 degrees, and tan of 150 degrees, something interesting happens. Your calculator tells you sine of 150 degrees is 0.5. I hope you recognize that that's the same as a half. Cos of 150 degrees is negative, 0 0.866. And tan of 150 degrees is negative, 0 0.577. And you go to your calculator and you try 210. Switch back to blue. Sine of 210 degrees, cos of 210 degrees, tan of 210 degrees, you type those into your calculator, and you notice that you get negative 0.5, negative 0 0.866, and positive 0 0.577. You're like, hmm, starting to notice an interesting kind of pattern here. I wonder if the same thing's going to happen with 330 degrees. So you type in sine of 330 degrees, cos of 330 degrees, and tan of 330 degrees into your calculator, and you get negative 0.5, positive 0 0.866, and negative 0 0.577. Why does this happen? Because they all have the same reference angle. But that's not a very convincing explanation. How does this work with trigonometry? And why are those values the same? And what is trigonometry, sine, cos, and tan, when you go past 90 degrees? Okay, Because we have an issue here. You know that sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. That's from grade 10. Okay, So I would like you to draw me a right angle triangle where one of the angles is 150 degrees, and tell me what goes bad. What, what, what 
what makes it so hard to do this? A 90 degree triangle, because that's how Sokotoa works, with only 90 degree triangles, right? And make this 150. What's the other angle? <laughs> it just, it's just, it's bad already, right? We're already over 180 degrees in our triangle, and so we have an issue. So we're sort of saying, well, how can I do Sokotoa, sine, cos, and tan, with angles that are bigger than 90 degrees, because I can't draw a triangle with that that makes sense. So how does the mathematics work? Because our calculator says it's a half. And our calculator says it's negative 0.866, and it says it's negative 0.577. It says it exists, but it doesn't work with my grade 10 math that says I need to make a right angle triangle. So once we go past 90 degrees, the reason it works is because I drew a triangle here that was a right angle triangle. Can you see that if the reference angle is 30, I could draw exactly the same triangle here? And if the reference angle is 30 in quadrant 3, I could draw exactly the same triangle here. And in quadrant 4, exactly the same triangle there. And if I draw those triangles and label things, sine, cos, and tan, I'll have the same opposite, the same hypotenuse, the same adjacent side. And so that's why the values are the same. But another thing that is connected to this that you learned in grade 11 is something called the cast rule. Do you remember the cast rule? Draw it up over here. Right? Also known as the Acts rule, the Astic rule, or the Tkas rule. But for whatever reason, we went with cast. Maybe it was the easiest word to come up with. So because it spells the word cast, we call it the cast rule. And the cast rule is based on where things are positive. So if we look in quadrant one, the sine ratio, I'm going to highlight all the positive ones, is positive. Cos is positive, and tan is positive. But when we get to quadrant two, cos and tan are negative, only sine is positive. When we get to quadrant three, sine and cos are negative, only tan is positive. And in quadrant four, sine and tan are negative, and only cos is positive. So the cast rule just tells us where things are positive. In quadrant four, we have the C that tells us only cosine is positive, has a positive ratio in quadrant four. Now, one of the things that we're going to discover a little bit more, and a reason for that, is that if sine is opposite over hypotenuse, and in this situation, the hypotenuse we're going to consider always to be a positive number. My opposite side is going up one. That's considered positive. In quadrant two, my opposite side is going up one, considered positive again. So sine stays positive. As soon as we get to quadrant three, my opposite sign is negative. Sine becomes negative. My opposite side is negative in quadrant four sine becomes negative in quadrant four. Can you see that that works with cosine as well? If cos is adjacent, my adjacent side is positive. Here, my adjacent side goes to the left, it's negative. Quadrant three goes to the left, it's negative. Quadrant four, my adjacent side goes to the right again, it's positive. And so cosine is positive in quadrant four because of that. And tangent, is the opposite over adjacent. Can you see in quadrant one, opposite and adjacent are both positive. But in quadrant two, my opposite's positive, my adjacent's negative. In quadrant three, my opposite and adjacent both go into the negative quadrants. And so negative divided by negative becomes positive. And in quadrant four, my opposite side is negative, my adjacent side is positive. So there's a little bit more of an explanation of why the cast rule works. I mean, you can see it if you do examples. 
that some are positive, some are negative. But now in grade 12, we start to look at what are some of the reasonings behind that. And so in mathematics, we end up needing to do ratios for angles bigger than 90 degrees. How do they work and why they work are based on reference angles. So that means if you know the reference angle and you know, for example, that sine of 30 degrees is a half, then you know all of the other angles that have that same reference angle. And I can even go past 360 degrees. I can now ask you, can you do sine of 510 degrees? Well, where would 510 degrees be? You'd go 360 plus another 150 more. 510 degrees would end in quadrant 2 and would have a reference angle of 30 degrees. So if you go to your calculator and, assuming my mental math of adding was wrong, sine of 510 degrees, sure enough, it's equal to 0.5 again. Because it ends in quadrant 2, it's going to be positive for sine, and it has a reference angle of 30 degrees. So that is why reference angles are important. Because if you know one angle, then you can find the other ones. And if you know what the reference angle is, then you can translate everything back to grade 10 math and use Sokotoa again. Because you could draw a regular triangle in that quadrant, and you can do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And in the end, you just need to apply the cast rule to decide should the answer be positive or should it be negative. And the last definition, so if you're running out of room on page 467, you can continue in the columns on page 468. The last definition we're going to look at something called coterminal angles. And we'll start with that. Two angles are coterminal if. And what kind of game could we play this time? Could play one similar to the first game, the coterminal angle or not coterminal angle game. So exciting. Soon these will be on like TV all over the place and like game shows and it'll be like people making thousands of dollars playing coterminal or not coterminal. So I'm just going to put yes here and no here. Whew. Let's see, should I try to make this game as difficult as possible? Or I, I, could, like I could make this game so simple you'd figure it out right away, but then that wouldn't be as much fun. Well, uh, yeah, we'll try to make it a little bit more challenging. Um, 30 degrees and 150 degrees. They have the same reference angle. Are they coterminal? No. Um, but, oh, 30 degrees and 390 degrees. They have the same reference angle. Are they coterminal? Yes. What about 50 degrees, negative 50 degrees, Ooh. and maybe negatives aren't allowed. Um, oh, and 310 degrees. Those ones are, yes. Oh. But, um, negative 100 degrees and 100 degrees are not. 
even though they have the same reference angle. How about 72.3 degrees and 72.3 degrees? They are coterminal. What? Yeah, good. Thought you were going somewhere. That's, I'm trying to try and get those the ones in there where you think, okay, I think I know what's going on, and then maybe I get lost. How about one degree and 3,601 degrees? Yes, they are. Now, it is my hope that some people will still put up their hands if I say, is anybody still thoroughly confused? Good, good. I was hope, I mean, I'm, that's not my job as a teacher. It'd be so much easier if my job was just to confuse you all the time. I would have, I mean, I think I could have a lot of fun with that, but that might not be the best teaching methods, okay? But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of these examples again with a diagram instead of just the numbers. So if I did 30 degrees and 390 degrees, 30 degrees in green, 390 degrees in black. That's the first one. Then I'm going to do 30 degrees in green and 150 degrees in black. That one's a no. Go back to another yes. Negative 50 degrees in green. 310 degrees in black, that was a yes. Negative 100 degrees in green, positive 100 degrees in black, that was a no. Ooh, 72.3 degrees in green. 72.3 degrees in black. That was a yes. And one degree in green. And 3,601 3, degrees in black. Ready for this? This also hypnotizes you a little bit if you're watching. So you might not know, but right now you are in a hypnotic state. You're open to suggestions, so I'm just going to... You like math. You will study extra hard for math. So this, this, you know, afterwards, you're going to be happy because you'll wake up next morning and you'll be like, oh, I just feel like studying math, and it's all because of this lesson. If you feel it fade away, just pull up the video again and watch it again. You'll, I'm telling you, it's going to help. So that one, whew, whoa, there we go. That one, ooh, see, it's still working. Um, that one was yes. So now that you've seen the diagrams, does it become a little bit more clear what coterminal and not coterminal are? If you had to do your definition, two angles are coterminal if they share the 
the same terminal R. I guess I should maybe add two angles in standard position. Sp uh, SP is not actually the formal shortened form of standard position, but we'll use it for now. If two angles are in standard position and are coterminal, they share the same terminal arm, they end in the same place. The diagrams help you see that way better than just using the numbers, right? I could have done that to begin with and been nicer, but I didn't feel like doing that today. So two angles are coterminal if they share the same terminal arm. I mean, that definition is in your textbook as well. I think they've got on that on page 468, if we go far enough, there it is. You can, you can also highlight it. Angles in standard position with the same terminal arm are coterminal angles if you wanted to highlight it again. So they've showed some examples of 40 degrees, 400 degrees, 760 degrees in the textbooks attempt to hypnotize you as well, but they don't do a good job of entering those important messages afterwards about wanting to study more math and, and liking math. 